and welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Thank you for joining me. Yes, I am in a red t-shirt, Kenny's Crime Cult. Can't help but mention it, because it's obviously in your face. Also, throughout this video, if you hear a strange howling in the background, it's not a ghost, it is just the wind. It seems we're having a bit of a gale in this area right now, so apologies if you can hear it. If you're new to this channel and you're wondering what is she rambling on about, well, I release crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously every single week. So if you like crime and you like consistency, this is definitely the channel for you. If you have not subscribed yet, please take a moment to do so. Give me a like, give me a comment if you like what you see here. I tend to do very deep dives and they tend to be quite lengthy, but nonetheless, I always give you them in one go. So you don't have to wait for the next installment. Thanks to all my Patreon subs, you're helping me make better content. But as I always say, everybody who comes here, you're awesome. If you haven't joined me for a live chat, then please do. I'm usually there on a Wednesday and Sunday. The Kenny's Crime Court community is growing and it is absolutely lovely. What have I got in store for you today? That is, of course, the question. Well, I've got another serial killer. Yep, another serial killer for you. One hopefully a lot of you will not have heard of and one that is gonna, as ever, shock you because serial killers have that impact on us, don't they? I'm gonna be talking about Jerome Henry Brudos. Now, he was better known as Jerry Brudos. Born on the 31st of January, 1939 in Webster, South Dakota. His parents were Henry and Eileen Brudos. He also had two older brothers, but there are some reports that say he just had one. That may be because the one who doesn't want to appear has tried to alienate himself fully from the family by probably changing name and destroying any evidence that he was indeed related genetically to this family. Potentially. Anecdotal that. I don't have any evidence for it. But in the information that I found, some say he had one brother, some say that he had two. Nevertheless. I'm gonna probably go with the idea that there was two. Brudos did have a really unhappy childhood with respect. So first of all, he wasn't a planned child. Neither was my brother. He was very much wanted, but obviously for some people, particularly when times were very difficult regarding things like contraception and when children actually came at a cost, for many families, when you had an unplanned child, it could genuinely be disastrous and understandably that could create, shall we say, some negative feelings projected towards that child. It does feel as if Brudos had this occur. When his mother actually found out that she was pregnant, the way that she dealt with that was that she just focused and fixated on wanting a little girl. I never get that. As long as I've got five fingers and five toes ideally and the healthy, why would you worry? But at the end of the day, I suppose people have got particular ideas about what their family unit will look like. She already had boys and therefore, as far as she was concerned, if they were gonna go ahead with this pregnancy, if she got a girl, it would at least create the family that she had idealized in her head. So when Brudos is born, she was bitterly disappointed by all accounts. She had another boy. This didn't fit in with her position and view of what she wanted her life to be like. And it seems that even though this was something that she experienced individually, she didn't hide it. So she just let her youngest child know from the get-go that she was not happy that he had been born as opposed to a girl. And people who knew the family and knew the relationship suggest that she basically resented his very existence. And that for any child would be pretty catastrophic. Like I said, I'm never trying to find any empathy or sympathy for the results and actions of these individuals, but I think we have to look at what contributed towards that individual becoming the person that they are. As you will know, if you've watched some of my other videos, the distinction between psychopath and sociopath is that a psychopath is basically somebody that we imagine is born with those kind of predispositions. So they're born that way. Whereas a sociopath is created. So dependent on the contributory factors, along with everything else in your world, you can essentially activate a sociopath. And certainly, if we were going to look at the ingredients list of possibility in forming somebody who becomes a sociopathic killer, well, certainly abandonment issues, trauma, attachment concerns, they're all going to be big contributors. Most children desire inherently, instinctually, on a very primordial basis, the love and care and consideration of their primary caregivers, particularly the maternal level of care. 
It's what we are programmed to expect. When that isn't present, well, that can be a huge problem for the child. It makes them question their very existence and also their very worth. So he had a real lack of love and affection and it feels like early on this comes to frame his world, so to speak. If it wasn't bad enough that his mother was somebody who just wasn't engaged with him and made him feel like she didn't want him to be around, she was also really physically and emotionally abusive towards him. So we're getting the big, big red flags here. We're getting the neglectful parent, which is catastrophic on the development of a child. But we're also getting the physical abuse, the emotional abuse. So these are huge, huge problems for a child. And they do often indicate potential problems in the future because you're losing out on the very foundations of what you expect to go through when you were a child to grow into a well-adjusted young person than adult. She had a deal in her life where it wasn't enough to just be neglectful and horrible to him. She also wanted to go out of her way to make him feel terrible. So she'd disparage him whenever she got the opportunity. And she had a lot of opportunities because unfortunately the other primary caregiver, his father, just was away from home a great deal with his work. And that meant that he was left at the mercy of her constantly. She was uncaring. She was deeply overbearing as a mother. And she also gave his brothers far more love and attention than she gave him. And I think that when you think about the passive aggression, forget the actual aggression that you're seeing and playing out in the emotional and physical abuse he's receiving, but if you think about the more passive aggressive technique, where you're not actually doing very much to the person, but the actions that you're carrying out around that person gives a very clear message. Well, she's doing that. If she's being overtly loving and caring to his brothers, and then she's ignoring him, that is really painful. So we're seeing this clear connection that she has with wanting to abuse him in as many ways as possible. And this leads to Brudos, understandably, absolutely understandably, feeling really different from the very outset. He essentially becomes a family outcast. So nobody feels that he has a sense of belonging in that family. And it's kind of even worse that in spite of the fact that we've seen all of these big red flags and this abusive scenario playing out and this little boy who's innocent at this moment in time of any offenses, that because his mother wants a daughter so badly, she even dresses him in girl's clothes. Now again, I used to dress my brother in girl's clothes. And let me tell you, when he was four years old and he had beautiful blonde long hair and I put them in pigtails and put him in a blue dress with red cherries on and called him Anna. He looked great. That's all I'm saying. And there was a moment where he said he wanted to be referred to as Anna and my father literally said to me that he thought I broke my brother. My dad was old school. Please excuse him. He didn't realise that that was not possible. But what I'm saying is a lot of us have done fun things, haven't we, with our siblings. I think that dress up is fun but it's different when it's just playing. It's playful experience. Who hasn't done that? The same as boys wearing fairy dresses, girls wearing fairy dresses and so on and so forth. It's about being playful in childhood. And realistically, that's a very big separation from a parent putting you in girls' clothes when that isn't your gender that you associate with. Because at the end of the day, you want to be affirmed by a parent and therefore, if you're desperate to be loved, if you're desperate to be approved of, and actually you get some of that when you're being dressed in girls' clothes, then to some degree that could cause some confusion in what you associate with being accepted by the people that you're desperate for acceptance in. And so to some degree, we can see that she's really, really abusing him on a whole range of levels, including making him feel that his gender isn't actually acceptable. And that is problematic for this child. And I think it plays out further down the line. Now the family also add to some of this dysfunction because they move around quite a lot before they finally settle in Salem, Oregon. And as you will all be aware, any of you who've moved around in your childhood, it can be quite challenging to meet friendships anyway, because 
This idea that children are just able to hit the ground running and meet loads of peers and just go off and have fun, it doesn't play out in reality. It can be overwhelming for a child to meet peers. And the thing that we know about this particular man who's a child at this point growing up is he's already got some eccentricities about his behavior. I'll talk about those in a few minutes. And he's not necessarily embraced by his family, so he feels an outsider. Those are things that are gonna impact on his peer relationships. They make it more difficult for him to engage with other people. That that therefore means that if he's being taken out of his schools and moved from his areas regularly, well, he's not getting the opportunity to create those solid relationships that are so important when you don't have them elsewhere. So as I've said, they move around a great deal. Now, whether it was actually a predisposition in Brudos or his mother's treatment of him, for example, her desire for having a daughter or the combination of all three of the neglect, the desire of her wanting to be a daughter and actually Brutus having a particular predisposition within his nature. He seemed to develop a very peculiar and eccentric behavior as a child and it seemed to fixate on women's shoes. So aged five, he finds a pair of women's high-heeled shoes. He's playing on a rubbish tip in Portland and obviously, as we all know, when you get the opportunity to go and have a look through people's items that might have been discarded. It can be quite exciting. And you're always looking for things like jewelry and playful things. It's what we do as kids, isn't it? Although I never went and played on a rubbish tip. That wasn't for me. Rubbish tips, a little bit too far. But you know, charity shops or going to jumble sales, things where you could just kind of root through and find treasure. But for him, it's something that's immediate. So he sees these high-heeled shoes and he's just instantly captivated by them, fascinated by them. And at five years old, it's enough to make him want to take them home. When he does take them home, however, he gets severely punished by his mother. She, he's wearing them at the time, and her response to seeing him in these shoes is that she calls him wicked. She also tells him to take them back to the dump, but he's so captivated by them and there is something that connects him with these shoes that he doesn't want to do that, so he hides them. And then when she finally finds the shoes, as parents do, as much as children think that they can hide things from their adults, they just can't, realistically, because parents are always going to be cleaning up and so on and so forth. And there are very few places you can hide anything from a parent. Believe me, I've tried hiding things from my parents as a kid. Always went wrong. Always went wrong. But he hides them, and she finds them. And so what does she do with that? She burns them in a fire. For this child, it's another alienation, isn't it? He's now not just feeling that she doesn't accept his gender, he isn't enough as a child, that she doesn't want him in the main family to some degree, but now something that actually really made him feel happy, she's made him feel terrible and shame about. That's the problem, because we don't want children to feel levels of shame. Shame makes you run and hide, it doesn't make you work through it. But also, where were the questions? What was the analysis of that situation? You find your kid wearing girls' heels, so what? Isn't there a conversation to be had there? And I know that times were different, I appreciate that. But it feels like a massive leap, doesn't it? From seeing your child playing dress up, to calling them wicked, and being abusive towards them and then burning something of importance to them. It amplifies what that is for the child. It amplifies it. And I'm saying that because on one level, what we can see with children is a desperate need to be accepted by a parent. And therefore, when a parent tells them to do A, B or C, they tend to follow A, B or C because they imagine that that's a way of connecting their relationship. But if a parent is somebody that you end up having resentments towards, that you feel a rage towards, and then you connect it with this very thing that they're telling you that you must be denied of, well, can't that volumize the need? Doesn't that turn it on at a higher volume and make the fixation grow? And then what happens if you have this fixation that you've been taught shame about, that you're not meant to have, and it connects with a rage towards a woman in your life, a female, who's also your mother, could that not contribute to some pretty serious pathology when it comes out to playing out your actions in the future? Just a suggestion. I'm just posing it right now. I'm just deep diving into the potential analysis of how these things can corrupt in the end.
So for Brudos, what essentially could have been seen as a naive, natural, childlike curiosity was just instantly viewed by his mother as something unnatural and disgusting, which of course are words that we should never associate with a child. At five years of age, you are not unnatural, you are not disgusting, quite the contrary. Your actions come from a naivety that is anything but corrupted. It's completely innocent. But she starts to put these adult perspectives and perceptions on her child. And it's ironic because this is the same mother who's now calling him weird, suggesting he's unnatural. But she was the one who was cross-dressing her son and basically making Brudos feel that he would have been more acceptable and wanted if he'd been female. So it's her that has caused potentially the initial confusion. And without a doubt, it has an impact on his development because when he's a child, he instantly realizes that pretty much anything that's sex related as far as his mother is aggressively disapproved of. She is in no way, shape or form accepting of sex. So again, this is very difficult for a young male growing up. We want our primary caregivers to be people that are safe places and safe spaces. We certainly want to be able to acknowledge who we are as human beings and part of that is sexual beings. And again, this idea of shutting him down where there's anything sexual, because that in itself, again, additionalizes that layer of shame. Now, the family then continue to move again, this time to Riverton, California. And it really seems like at this point, Brutus' fascination with women's shoes had well and truly taken hold. There's a massive escalation. And he actually finds himself in trouble at school. So his first grade teacher, she keeps a spare pair of shoes at work, and he manages to get hold of them. But unfortunately for him, one of his classmates knows that he's done that and grasses him up so he gets found out. But you can see, can't you, that there is immediately at this point a need for him to have that connection. And it's interesting to me that it's his teacher that he goes for as far as those shoes. Now, one level we can say was opportunism. At the end of the day, he probably realized that the shoes were there and he could get hold of them. And of course, we can acknowledge that opportunity is always something that plays into people taking things. But what does the teacher represent? A lot of the time, a teacher represents a pretty safe maternal figure. And if you haven't got one of those at home, is there a desire for him to take those shoes because actually there is a nurture value to them? Again, this is just my own thoughts and feelings psychologically about the potential connection, but it does interest me that it's his teacher's shoes that he's taking. And this obviously gets him into trouble. I wouldn't imagine for one minute that the teachers think that there is any strange paraphilia, so sexual connection with these. I would imagine that they just thought he was either being mischievous or maybe taking them home for his mum and so on and so forth. He also, around the same time though, starts taking his mother's shoes. And every time this happens, what is her response? She just punishes him. And I appreciate this is a neglectful, abusive mother. So I appreciate we can't expect a great deal from her as far as lessons learned or being interested about why this child is acting this way. But it always surprises me when a parent, even when they are a poor parent, doesn't actively consider thinking about why the child is reacting, responding this way. What is it that is the message in this behavior? And she just doesn't do that. Every time it just goes straight to, you're gonna get beaten up because that's how I respond to you acting out of line. But again, for Brudos, this is just constantly this reference of whatever he does that's important to him, even if it's eccentric and a bit strange, as opposed to it being explored, it's immediately shut down and there is a terrible punishment at the end of it for him. And again, just think about how children start as very young people building up rage and resentment. And also think about where shame goes. Any of you who've ever experienced a shameful experience, particularly as a child, it is so difficult to hold with you. It really is. It's like the most traumatic feeling and we just want to get rid of it. And very rarely do we know how to deal with shame. And that's why people who have a lot of traumatic experiences who feel terrible shame beat themselves up for many years over it because they seek to control it 
when they don't realize that mostly shame is given to you by other people. It's not yours to hold. But for him, this is undoubtedly creating more and more of these unmanageable feelings. So if you think about the episodes that I've just explored there, then you combine it with, shall we say, the naturally eccentric behavior that he's emitting. Well, it meant that he didn't have a good time at school at all. In fact, he was horribly bullied, really mercilessly teased, picked on by his classmates. And even though we can say, oh, that's really cruel, kids shouldn't do that. Look, that's life. It's awful, but it's part and parcel of how we survive. We tend to gravitate towards people who are similar to us, who we feel more safe around, or who we feel that if we're not friends with, we might get harm from. So we kind of gravitate towards them for our own protection. And if there is somebody who seems to be strange, acts oddly, doesn't seem to fit in with what we consider normal, then we tend to be avoidant of them because on a primordial survival level, they represent something very different and therefore it's unfamiliar. And when it's unfamiliar, we either want to avoid it or as many children do, poke fun at it because we haven't got the boundaries and level of moral conscience at that point to understand that that can have a horrible impact on them. So he's alienated and isolated by his classmates this way, which would have just added to this sense of not fitting in and not being good enough. So this sad home life combined with this really unhappy school life, it seems that, as I said earlier on, when we're looking at the sociopathic ingredients list, that he's getting his developed. You know, this developing character becomes a lonely, socially awkward child and becomes obsessed with his own internal world. And this internal world is focused around one thing that he can absolutely fundamentally control, and that's his foot fetish. And he also starts to develop a woman's underwear fetish as well. Now, these are paraphilias. A paraphilia is something that is sexual, but falls outside of the realms of what we would consider a typical experience and connection with sex. And things like a foot fetish or wearing underwear, they're considered things that fall atypically. So essentially, they're not what the majority of people would find a turn on. And it feels like both the underwear fetish and the foot fetish and shoe fetish just becomes a massive dominating factor in his life and a dominating factor that was so consuming, so ultimate for him that it ends up leading him down a criminal path. So we've looked at Brutus's troubled childhood and it's really challenging for him, isn't it? The fact that he's had no consistency, he's got this abusive experience, but also these constant moves. And he has two further moves, in fact. So what I've been talking about is very early childhood. But between the ages of 8 and 12, he moves to Grant Pass, then to Wallace Pond, Oregon. And it's at this point that other people start noticing that there is something that isn't quite right about him. The neighbours at these addresses actually had teenage daughters. And Brudos, as a very young child, bear in mind he's a young kid, he would sneak into their rooms, he'd play with their clothes, he'd even steal their clothes. And he realised at this point that it wasn't just a fixation with the clothing and underwear and shoes, there was something additional to that, it was the sexual gratification that he actually started to feel from dressing up in the women's clothes. He actually had a teenage girl, which was a family friend, who used to visit the family often, and Brudos would consistently try to steal her shoes. And she actually once awoke with him trying to remove those shoes from her feet. What are we seeing there? Well, really low boundaries, because there's one thing finding a pair of shoes on a rubbish tip or stealing a pair of shoes that aren't connected to somebody's feet. But when you're actually getting to the point where you're going into the neighborhood kids' rooms and wearing the clothes, I mean, that's low boundaries, isn't it? You know, you will get caught there. It means that you've got very poor impulse control, but actually trying to remove somebody's shoes from their feet whilst they're actually wearing them. I mean, that is really poor decision making, isn't it? Because one of two things is gonna happen. They're gonna wake up and be like, what are you doing taking my shoes off? That's a really weird thing to do. Or the second thing is they're gonna wake up and they won't have any shoes. Either way, they're gonna be looking for the shoes and you're gonna be the one wearing them. Not good impulse control. Now, as he starts to get a little bit older, still young, still you know, prepubescent to pubescent, it consistently gets reinforced that sex is bad. 
So on one occasion, he actually has a wet dream, completely natural and normal. Lots of boys go through this from like 11 years onwards, literally. A lot of kids would like to have wet dreams very regularly, let's be honest. But when his mother finds out, she actually makes him scrub his sheets by hand. So it's that level of shame that he's done something wrong. This is completely natural, completely normal. It's a normal sexual experience to go through. And she's making it be highlighted as something that he's done that's shameful. He's made to feel this constant guilt and shame about something completely natural. And it's wrong of her to have done that per se. Now, because Brudos had these predilections, these particular fixations, he ends up visiting psychiatric wards regularly. He's constantly going to psychiatric hospitals during his teenage years. But it does feel that in spite of that, he never had a treatment that was able to undo the damage because the abusive upbringing had been so entrenched, so ingrained, so challenging for him that managing that and working through that was now an impossible. It was so deep rooted. And as he starts to grow up, as you would imagine, because this hasn't been dealt with and because there are such levels now, such gravity to this shame and also such escapism in the fact that this is the one area of his world that he feels he has a level of control and potentially a level of enjoyment and gratification because shoes and wearing women's clothes become part of that. It's his exploits actually become more alarming. So they start to escalate. And it is really concerning when you start thinking about this kind of trajectory he's been on. You know, we've seen him start to do the creeper kind of situations, going into women's rooms and kind of being in those teenage girls' bedrooms and trying on clothes. It's like a creeper situation, isn't it? Like we see when people go into burgling homes and they're actually just wanting to be there. It's a gratification knowing they're there and that they're getting chance to go around your items and that you've got away with it. That's like gratifying. So he's already done that as a really young person. But as he's getting a little bit older, he starts breaking into women's homes and it's all about stealing the shoes and underwear. So that's his one purpose. He's so fixated now with his paraphilia that he wants to get strangers clothing and he wants to be able to take them home with him as mementos. He keeps them in a personal collection at home and think about serial killers. What are the things that they do? They collect mementos, don't they? Now I know he hasn't killed anybody at this point, but that desire to possess, it's really important, isn't it, to just hear that. What is going on here? He has this desire to possess things that do not belong to him. And that for me is always a very slippery slope because when is that gonna be enough, just having items of clothing of the people that you've stolen from? You won't be surprised as well to know that in the area that he's living, he gets known as a peeping Tom. We these days would call them stalkers. But back in the day, it was just an old peeping Tom. He's just a bit of a peeping Tom, bit of a weirdo. Just goes looking at women through windows, isn't it? But that's not actually a peeping Tom. It's a sexual stalker. But back in the day, that was what they would be referred to. Just a peeping Tom, just looking at you whilst you're naked. Just a really freaky guy who's actually completely voyeuristically violating you. But just a peeping Tom. Also, was the first person who got caught called Tom. You know, like hurricanes, and they're like, Hurricane Martha, because it was Martha who noticed it was coming. And they were like, Martha, well done, we're calling the Hurricane Martha after you. You know, was it the same for Peeping Toms? Just saying. So obviously for those of you that don't know what Peeping Tom is, I've just described it. It means that you're hiding and watching women undress. And this is clearly criminal behavior, although it's very rarely taken seriously. Up until probably the 90s in the UK, it's probably very similar elsewhere. And I bet in some countries it's not even considered a crime. But this criminal behavior, it starts to go from what we consider minor property offenses to actual offenses against people. And he starts stalking local girls. This is why being a peeping Tom is so dangerous because that is genuinely where it begins, that they start spying on people. Nowadays, it would be online as well, so you won't even be aware of the fact that there's a peeping Tom. You won't be aware of cyber stalking because they get away with a lot of it without you even knowing. But when we didn't have cyber technology and connection and social media, it was very much about somebody spying on you without you knowing, finding out about your movements without being aware and so on and so forth. 
So he starts spying on local girls, stalking them. But then he actually went to physically abusing them. So he'd knock them unconscious or he'd choke them until they pass out. And at the point where they were unable to fight, he'd take their shoes and run off. So the shoes were his particular connection. That's what he wanted to achieve. Now at 17, if that's not sinister enough, this criminal behavior takes on an even more sinister turn. And it's at this point he starts admitting that he's got some really dark sexual fantasies and they involve abducting a woman, then forcing her to obey him and also to have a beg for mercy, so this dominance, this wanting to be fully in control of another human being. And it's when his family moved to Corvallis, that's in Oregon, he actually starts to make this fantasy in his head a reality and he actually starts prepping. So he's been ruminating on this, fantasizing about this, imagining what he might do if he's got somebody fully within his control. And he actually starts to prep. So he digs a hole in the hillside and this is where he's gonna keep his sex slaves, to use his term. And he puts on a mask, he gets armed with a knife and he actually beats and abducts a young woman. So he goes ahead. At this point, it's really harrowing because this girl is obviously completely unaware of why this has happened. She didn't know that she was being stalked by him. She obviously has no idea how this is gonna play out because this is a very dangerous person who has got a mask on and has a weapon. He threatens to stab her and says that if she doesn't satisfy his sexual demands, that he'll kill her basically. He also, during this assault and abduction, he basically forces her to strip naked and he takes photographs of her. So he's posing her in very sexual ways. He keeps the mask on throughout because obviously he doesn't want her to be aware of the fact that he is somebody from her neighborhood and certainly doesn't want her to have an opportunity at this point to be a witness to him, as in the fact that he wasn't covered. So therefore she would know exactly who he was when she described him to police. When he actually lets her go, and he does let her go, bear in mind, so he doesn't go ahead and murder her, but he actually approaches her just after he's let her go. He's not got a mask on at this point, and he actually has a conversation with her where he claims that he'd also been captive in a barn by the same man. Now, this is not a smart move. I mean, if you've let somebody go and got away with it and they haven't identified you, it's not potentially the most sensible situation or intelligent move to go and meet said victim with the same voice that you have, with the same build that you are made of, just without the mask, and say, oh, you'll never guess, we've got something in common. I too got taken by this crazy guy. Obviously, straight away, she's like, oh my God, that's him. And that's exactly what happens because she goes to the authorities his story is considered ridiculous by them and clearly this causes them to look at prosecuting him. So he gets arrested for this offence and he's actually sent to the Oregon State Hospital for nine months. Nine months is not a long time when you think about what I've talked about. This is a guy who literally abducted an innocent girl, subjected her to the most brutal sexual assaults, posed her in lots of ways, and basically will have made her life feel unsafe potentially for the rest of her life. And he gets nine months in the Oregon State Hospital. It's here he starts having therapy, that's a good thing. During this time in therapy that he actually starts to share details of what his warped sexual fantasies are. And on one level, this is good in the context that he actually has therapy. When you look at cases like Ed Kemper, co-ed killer, he was in a mental health unit for six years and he didn't get a day of therapy. His therapy seemed to be being allowed to look through all the graphic notes of the inmates, get turned on by them, and also get all the analysis questionnaires so that he could learn how to get out. Not the best therapy, with respect, but at least in this case, he is getting some therapy and he starts discussing them. And we always have to be aware as well that when somebody is discussing their sexual desires, on one level, therapeutically, it can be because they do want to work through them. On another, it can be that they get gratification from describing them, and it's always a fine line. It's the same when working with sex offenders. 
whether you're dealing with sex offenders in a way that is helpful and they're actually working through their predilection and fascination that's inappropriate or whether they're actually enjoying the work that they're hearing done by others which is describing the abuse that may be going on in their lives so again it can be a very challenging thing to actually manage therapy in these contexts but he starts to kind of describe what he wants to do he says he wants to have sex slaves he says that he's got this real fantasy where he wants to keep dead bodies in freezers and particularly in reference to them being in freezers frozen in sexual positions so again we're instantly getting the idea of potential necrophile here because why would you want their bodies in sexual positions they're not sculptors are they you're doing it for a possible reason of wanting intercourse with them in that way and ultimately it was established in therapy that his sexual fantasies you won't be surprised kind of centered around his hatred towards his mother and women in general think about his early experiences in childhood the conflicting experiences his mother presented him the confusion she's created the rejection the shame add to that potentially his peers at school not being people who embraced him and so on and so forth this is like a cooking pot of possibility of somebody developing deep pathology and neurosis and it seems like this is what's happening he's also diagnosed with borderline schizophrenia I bring that in because it's important that we're aware of somebody who may have a mental illness but we all know that a mental illness does not make you do horrible things like become a serial killer in fact quite the contrary on the whole it's usually particularly when it comes down to organized serial killers highly sane people who are psychopathic killers so even though he's had this period of time in hospital when he's released he's actually still able to graduate his high school in 1957 so again just a little nod there to the fact that in spite of the fact that he's had this potential borderline schizophrenia diagnosis he's still able to be cogent and get through school it's important to note that when people often have things like schizophrenia they can go through a real substantial decline because it's a really difficult issue to deal with and he is able to continue by march 1959 age 20 at this point he joins the military you won't be surprised to know it doesn't go well he gets discharged after a year he's just not considered the right kind of character and i think we can all imagine why he's got a big set of unusual predilections and i doubt very much that it would have been able to be something that was inescapably noticed by the people around him and because of that it's going to cause concern they definitely don't like any kind of paraphilia in the forces it's as simple as that it doesn't matter what you think it doesn't matter what i think they like their soldiers to be a certain way and type and certainly back in the 50s and 60s so anything that made him stand out would have been considered a position where he could get exited from the forces it's as simple as that even today people will get thrown out of the forces for lots of different things that you or i might just think is completely acceptable but that they certainly don't he then returns home only for a brief period and according to brudos his parents actually make him sleep in a barn during this time so bear in mind he's been in the military he's got through high school albeit he's been exited from the military the point is to come home and actually end up feeling like you're not just an outcast on an emotional level you're literally an outcast on a physical level you're being made to sleep in a barn it's reprehensible and it's unforgivable i appreciate that they may have some residual wounds as far as they're concerned from his incarceration as they would believe it be for what had happened with that girl it may be that they have a fear of him just to acknowledge that certainly what we're dealing with with brudos is somebody who's very complex and he would make people feel uncomfortable around him but it just again compounds this grief that he has around his family arguably we can also say well you know what at least they let him sleep somewhere because a lot of families may have completely rejected somebody who'd been incarcerated for doing pretty heinous things to an innocent girl I don't know what their reasons were but certainly on a psychological level for him it would be a further abandonment it would be a further recognition that there was something different about him and it would compound the rage that no doubt he felt towards his mother and probably his family in general 
Whilst the military didn't work out, he did actually manage to find work that he was well suited to and he became a skilled electronics technician, so an intelligent position. He was good with his hands and he starts working at a radio station, which is where he actually meets his future wife, Darcy Metzler. So at this point, he's actually able to connect with a woman and connect with her in a positive way enough for them to forge a future with each other. And by 1961, he actually gets married to 17-year-old Darcy. Obviously, she's incredibly young. My God, at 17, I was like, what is life? It feels exhausting. Do I have to get out of bed? Is there a pool table? Will somebody lend me some money so that I can eat something like a Greg's pasty? You know, that's the kind of thing that I was thinking about at 17. I hadn't even had a proper boyfriend at 17. The idea of getting married is harrowing. I mean, literally, I think back in 1961 as well, women were expected to be able to do things like make a casserole straight off my head at that point. I was like in my solid 20s before I even considered the idea of more than one thing in a pot. You know, usually I just buy an item and eat it. It can't just be me, can it? It's not just me that's like that. So at 17 years of age, they get married and the couple move to Portland, Oregon. But you will not be surprised that said sexual fetish that I've described in detail starts permeating their married life. And bear in mind as well, at this point in time, men used to be heads of the household. A lot of men listening now will be like, what? What's that? Yes, there was a point in time where men used to be head of the household. Sometimes I like looking at adverts from like the 1950s and 60s where they're like, how to make your husband happy? And it's like an advert for starch and you used to starch shirts and the shirts would look lovely and white and crisp. And now most of us are just like, wear it creased. Your body heat will make it fall out in the end. Is it just me who does that? But nonetheless, Men were considered heads of the household, weren't they? And to some degree, this would put her with less power in the relationship. So when he starts demanding sexual things that she might have been wholly uncomfortable with, she kind of gives them to him. And he would make her do things like do the housework, but she would not be allowed to wear anything but high heels while she was cleaning. And whilst he actually watched her cleaning, he'd take photographs of her. She also, actually caught him on occasions, several occasions in fact, wearing her lingerie. And this meant that she clearly knew from an early onset that the fact that he was wearing her lingerie and on top of that he was making her pose constantly naked whilst cleaning, that there is something that potentially makes him stand out from others. Bear in mind people were not very sexually experienced back in the day, so she wouldn't have a lot to compare it with, but I would imagine she knew that this was not something that was typical of most relationships. Also, he would be somebody who'd take photographs of himself cross-dressing, and then he'd actually leave them around the house for her to find. She found it really strange, but she tolerated it. Again, bear in mind, at the time, marriage was for life. Divorce did not come into the equation. If you were not happy in your relationship, it was your bed, you would lie in it. I can still remember my grandma using that term to describe situation. It was your bed, lie in it. These days it's like, that was my bed, I was gonna lie in it, it's really uncomfortable now, I don't like it, I'm gonna burn the bed. You know, that's how we approach things in the modern day. But it was very different, so she tolerates it. And again, I'm sure this was concerning her, but she's getting on with her married life. And they have two children together. So they've got a first daughter named Megan, and then they have a son named Jason. So she's busy with family life. And to all intents and purposes, it's worth noting as well that when people were looking into their relationship, when people from the outside in were assuming things about their relationship, well, that family looked like they were nailing it. He seemed like a really happily married man who was raising two kids in Portland. He was seen by other people to be really softly spoken. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke. He was considered a devoted family man. In fact, he didn't even swear. So if you're painting a picture of possibility, then this guy is so much more likely to be a priest than a killer, just by the way he acts. 
He doesn't raise any suspicions whatsoever among his neighbours. But in reality, these paraphilias, they were just driving him to become more and more violent. And they would soon get to a place where they were utterly uncontrollable. He actually kept his personal collection of stolen underwear and the shoes that he'd managed to acquire in his garage workshop. Now, his wife was absolutely forbidden. She wasn't allowed to enter that area unless she actually notified him. She had to get in touch with him via an intercom. Hello, I'm coming. Give me half an hour. Don't enter until then. Literally, that's what it was like, an intercom. But it's really disconcerting because yes, she wasn't allowed to go there unless she first gave him notice. And so obviously he's being secretive, but how secretive would you need to be when in fact, in the long term, he ended up keeping his victims in there. So she must have been controlled to the point where she didn't enter at all unless she was given the go ahead. And one would imagine that at certain points, cause he had his victims there, she wasn't allowed to enter at all. But for whatever reason, she wasn't asking further questions or refusing to actually go ahead and go by his desires. If I'd been her, I'd have been like, what's he got in the garage? I'd have been in there like a shot. But she behaves herself in this respect. So did she think he had some potential? I suppose some people will question, did she know that he had victims there? Or was she so diligently getting on with married life and disinterested in what was going on there that she didn't really care? Who knows? But the reality is something was going on in that situation in time that she would have been aware of he wanted to keep secret. Now it's around this time he also starts to develop crippling migraine headaches. He had blackouts, they were so severe. And this seems to feed in to an opportunity for him to create an excuse to go out at night. So he just wants to walk around, he wants fresh air. He doesn't want these symptoms of migraine to persist. So anything he can do to kind of clear them is gonna be helpful. And I suffer from migraine and I have a complete empathy with anybody who suffers from migraine because they are heinous. But the last thing I would do with a migraine is go outside for a walk. I'm like, turn the lights off. Keep the noise down, bring me pain medication. You know, anything that kind of reduces my sensory experience. And I think most people agree with that and align with that. So the fact that he was going out for a walk at night just spanks of the fact that he was making it up. And it's true, he is making it up and he's doing it for one reason and one reason alone. He is just prowling the streets like a predator just looking for opportunities to steal shoes, looking for opportunities to take underwear, and also likely spying on women in his area. And it's at this point that it's noted that there is a real strain within his marriage. Darcy is becoming exhausted with this bizarre behavior. She's got married, hoping that she's gonna have the American dream. She's got the two children, She's got the house, she's got the guy with the career, but she's also got this person who's turning out to be a very odd character sexually. And she starts using an opportunity to just focus more on her kids. So she leaves him to all his own devices and she starts being quite disinterested in him. But what do we know about Brudos? Is this going to make him check that behavior? Because if your partner suddenly becomes completely disinterested in you and they aren't communicating with you, they don't want to necessarily have sex with you, they almost seem to have abandoned the relationship though they are still present. And also they're just concentrating their focus on their children. That would usually give you an indicator that you need to do some work on yourself and the relationship because you're feeling that there are these clear references that they've changed their behavior towards you. And if you want to retain the intimacy, you work on it. And he doesn't. And why? Well, he's used to it, isn't he? This is a man who is used to his family rejecting him, abandoning him. So as much as Darcy may well be trying to give him these kind of clear indicators, you know, there is something wrong in our relationship. He's just like, ah, well, lived this before. This is what I expect. So his whole childhood had essentially set him up to cope in this situation. Around 1967, he stalks a woman in Portland because he liked her shoes. He actually follows her home, waits till she goes to bed. Then he broke into her home, strangled her until she passed out. Then he raped her and then he steals her shoes. He actually took those shoes home with him and he slept with them. And 
I'm going to be honest, you didn't get connected with that crime until later on. But the incident itself, the going and carrying out that violent fantasy, oh. And Brutus actually said that the incident had a really significant impact on him because there was something different about this event. He'd choked her, he'd made her unconscious, and that meant that her body was limp. And he found the limp body deeply arousing. Now, somophilia is a paraphilia which is characterized by wanting the person that you're having sex with to be unconscious. It's often why people will do things like spike people's drinks. A lot of people these days are getting injected with drugs that make them totally pass out. On one level, people can say, well, that's about dominance and control. People are doing that because it means that the person is rendered helpless and they can do what they want with them. But also, if you have a particular predilection where you don't want anything but passivity in your victim, then this is characterized by this disorder. And for him, it's a real moment. It pleasures him to know that the other person is firstly at his mercy, secondly unaware, and most importantly, that their body represents that passivity. So we can see that there is this escalation, this graduating in Brutus's criminal behavior, and it's heading for this inevitable climax, so to speak and it leads to his first murder. And that first murder victim was 19-year-old Linda Slawson. She lived with her mother and her siblings in Alloa, Oregon. And on the 26th of January, 1968, all Linda is doing is her job. She's selling encyclopedias door to door in Southwest Portland. I don't know whether those younger people listening will understand what I'm talking about, but for many, many years, when I was a kid, you'd get a knock at the door and somebody would literally be selling encyclopedias. They'd usually bring one with them. You could look at it. And then if you wanted to, you could order the entire range. You could do it on a subscription. You could pay it at once. And it wasn't something that the majority of us did, but you kind of were considered quite wealthy if you could buy a set of encyclopedias. I mean, these days, you just have an iPad. But back in the day, it was considered quite a mark of respect to be able to do that and people would literally go and sell them to you. So all she is doing is her job. But Linda obviously is at risk because she's knocking on strangers' doors and she makes the fatal mistake and the only mistake of knocking on Brutus's door. He has the perfect ruse. Of course he wants to see the encyclopedias. Of course he wants to buy a set of encyclopedias. Remember, this is a mild-mannered, quiet man hardly the person that you believe is a predator. So he gets her inside and his wife and his kids were actually at home at the time. So he gets her in, then he incapacitates her by hitting her with a wooden plank and he then strangles her to death. And yes, you heard me right. His wife and his children were in the house when that actually happened. After Linda's dead, well, he has time, doesn't he? She can't call out, she can't ask for help, she can't fight him. He's got this opportunity to fulfill these warped fantasies. So he takes her into his workshop. First of all, he has sex with a corpse. So he's a necrophiliac now. Then he dresses her up and he's got all these items of underwear that he's stolen from other people. So he's got this personal collection. So he gets them out and starts to dress her in these things. And he put her in things like a nightgown and all these different objects that he'd managed to acquire from other people. He then takes lots of photos of her in lots of provocative positions. So remember what he was thinking about when he was talking in group therapy about freezing women and placing them in particular positions. He's actually living this out in this moment in time. Yes, they've not been frozen, but he's playing on that fantasy that he has in his head. And he really takes time. He repeatedly dresses her and then undresses her. And then after he's had his fill of that, obviously he has a body to contend with. So before he actually disposes of her, he mutilates her body. So he actually cuts off her left foot with a hacksaw. So that would be the first physical trophy that he ever takes from a murder victim. And he placed that in the freezer because he wanted to be able to take it out and then dress it again, so to put different shoes on it. And later he actually said this, I had a hacksaw and I cut off the left foot because I'm right-handed. I took it home and I put it in the freezer and used it for a photography model and to try shoes on. Photography models, the thing about them is they have the rest of the body. 
Otherwise, it's not a photography model. It's a severed foot. Oh. So after he's done what he wanted with the body and he's removed the foot, he then needs to dispose of Linda. So he takes her to the Willamette River. That's off the Wilsonville Bridge. And that body would never be found. Simple as that. So now he has the experience of killing. Now he knows what that feeling is like and he wants more of it. And in fact, after he kills Linda and he disposes of the body, he actually dresses up in high heels and he masturbates. So again, we've got this very clear connection with sex and death and self-fulfillment, self-pleasure. It's not about the other person, is it? Even masturbation, obviously, you can do that with another consenting partner, but for the most part, masturbation tends to be a solo activity. It's about pleasuring the self. But the fact that he's actually incapacitated, then murdered, then had sex with the body of this woman, and then it's the thoughts and images of that, and the dressing up and masturbating, it's all about a deeply egocentric, self-fulfilling experience of sexual behavior and gratification. His second victim, well, she's killed the same year. So now we are on serial killer territory. What do we know about serial killers? They need a cooling off period between kills and they have to kill two or more. He's on his second victim. He's now officially a serial killer. His second victim is 23 year old Jan Whitney. All she was doing was driving from Salem to Albany and her car breaks down. That was it. All she was doing was celebrating Thanksgiving. So, Obviously, her car's broken down, she needs some help. Brudos spots her on the side of the road and it's his perfect opportunity, isn't it? So he offers to give her a lift home. So like a knight in shining armor, Brudos promises her that she can go back to his where she can contact the garage. But he then follows the same MO as before. He strangles her to death in the car with a leather strap. And then he has sex with the body. And then as we know, he has his real fun. So he takes her now corpse back to his private workshop and he just has repeated post-mortem sex with her body. And now he actually goes further and he leaves her hanging from a pulley on the ceiling for several days. Several days. How safe was he that his wife wasn't going to go in there? I mean, several days? He's just completely at peace that no one's going to be going in investigating what's going on there. And during these several days, he really has fun with her body. He takes pictures of her, he molests her. He even positioned a mirror on the floor beneath the pulley. And in one of the photographs, he actually catches his own face. It's reflected in it. So investigators are able to see that and find that in the end. But yeah, he takes a photograph and essentially his face is reflected in it. So he accidentally takes this photo when he's photographing his victim. So he's really taking time out, isn't he? But even that wasn't enough. He's got these photographs, he's had a body there for days, but it's not enough for him. He needs something more to satisfy his sadistic pleasure. He wants a trophy of his kill. So you know he's got the foot of his last victim. So he removes her breasts. And he doesn't just remove her breasts, he then fills them with resin and he uses them as a paperweight. I mean, how insane and gratuitous is that? To mutilate this innocent victim and then to remove some of her sexual parts as far as he's concerned and use them as paperweights. He then stuffs brown paper into a mutilated chest and disposes of her body as before, which is in the Willamette River. He's clever in the fact that he actually attaches her body to a railway track piece because then that's heavy enough to keep it submerged. At this point, he also disposes of Linda's foot because it was really decomposed by that point, so it couldn't be of any use anymore. Jan's abandoned car, it was later discovered at a rest stop along Interstate 5. So of course, she just seemed to disappear into thin air. It was as simple as that. No one knew where she'd gone. 
His third victim was 19-year-old university student Karen Sprinker. She was murdered on the 27th of March 1969. The police had actually had several concerned phone calls because there was a man dressed in women's clothing who was acting suspiciously around an area outside Mira and Frank department store in Salem. It turns out it was Brudos. He was in drag and later on that day he actually abducted Karen from the car park at gunpoint. All she'd done was gone to meet her mum for lunch. So her car was found locked and abandoned on the store's rooftop car park. In contrast, however, to the previous killings, he actually kept her alive for a while. So he took her back to his home. Bear in mind, he's got his wife and kids living here and she's alive and he kept her in his workshop whilst that was happening. At this point, he raped her, he forced her to wear his shoes, kept putting her in his underwear collection. So she was essentially a doll to some degree, wasn't she? She was a mannequin. So this is a young girl. She'd be terrified. She's been abducted, captured, imprisoned, and he is not connecting with any of that. He is connecting with what her body represents to him. So he can make her embody what potentially he desires to be. He can utilize her physique to give him the view and the position and the sexual gratification that he desires. And we could argue that this is a representation of himself, that he wishes that he could be that body, that he resents the fact that he can't be that body and therefore he molests and destroys it after gratifying himself. Or it could just be that he enjoys invoking this horrible level of fear in his victims. And there's actually a picture of Karen's feet that Brudos took before he went ahead and killed her. Again, he took lots of pictures of her in various poses. And so he gets her to be put in all these sexual positions. She's completely aware that this is happening at the time. But then he puts her on the pulley and he hangs her by her neck as he had hung the other body for several days. But this time he actually uses a contraption to lift her off the floor. And then he leaves the room while she's strangled to death. So again, interesting in the fact that a lot of our serial killers, that's the bit they enjoy, isn't it? The bit that they enjoy is watching that victim die. They like watching them gasp for breath. They enjoy being the master of their doom. They like creating that fatal blow. But it's not like he does. It's almost as if he requires a passive body and he needs to do things to make that happen. And he's choked people and strangled people before, but is it that at this point he's find a better method where he doesn't have to be present when he kills them? Therefore, he can have the body without confronting what he was actually doing, which is the murder of this innocent girl. Then, of course, he comes back and he repeatedly has sex with her corpse. And then again, same behavior. He mutilates her body. So just like with Jan, he removes her breasts and he makes resin molds from them and then he disposes of her body, the remains of which go in the Willamette River. So we're seeing this pattern. It's horrible, isn't it? And the fact that he's actually keeping parts of these women, possessing parts of these women. And it's less than a month later, so less than a month after Karen is killed, Buddha strikes again. This is the 21st of April, 1969. This is an attempted abduction. This time he attempts to abduct 24 year old Sharon Wood at gunpoint. She's on the basement floor car park in Portland. And he actually tries to drag her into a green waltz wagon. It's actually his mother's car. Now Sharon has the wherewithal in this moment because she knows something awful is happening to her to kind of look around as she's being dragged away and she spots someone in a yard nearby so she screams to them and at this point, you know what I say guys, always fight. Make yourself as loud as possible because you don't want to comply with somebody dragging you away. So this is exactly what happens. She breaks his fantasy and he's like now caught in the headlights, essentially. There's a witness potentially. And because it kind of disconcerts him, she's able to pull away. But we all know that she is absolutely lucky to escape with her life because essentially he would definitely have killed her. But it doesn't deter him. So it's not as if this makes him think, oh, Maybe somebody's going to be able to pin the fact that I was trying to abduct this innocent woman and there's a green Volkswagen involved and so on and so forth. He's undeterred by this 
as we said very early on, when he was stealing his teacher's shoes, poor boundaries, right? Same when he was trying to take the shoes off the teenager, poor boundaries, not thinking that much ahead about consequences. So the next day, again, he attempts to abduct 15 year old Gloria Jean Smith. She's literally on her way home from school. Now he threatens her with a gun. It actually turned out it was a plastic gun, but she wouldn't have known. But again, thankfully, she's unsuccessful. And she manages to pull free as he's dragging her to his car. And he panics at this point, jumps in the car, drives away. Again, she clearly escaped with her life. And thank God she did. Sadly, and there always is a sadly in this story, his fourth victim and his final victim, in fact, wasn't so lucky. 22-year-old Linda Sally. She was a secretary from Beaverton and obviously she's just living a life. So this time he pretends that he's a police officer. It's the 23rd of April, 1969, and he actually abducts her from the Portland Lloyd Shopping Centre car park. And actually that's quite clever. First of all, car parks often are quite abandoned. You know, people are go, get out, go to the shops, right? So you do have time frames where it will be empty. Secondly, a lot of parking lots, well, people will park in all sections and you can often find more abandoned areas. If you can get a woman there, it's gonna be miles easier to get her into a car and she's not gonna be able to get help. Also ask yourself this, who is more likely to be at the shops in the day? It's females, because it's females who tend to do the shopping, particularly at this time of year, you know, 1969. So to some degree, he's really refined where the best place is to procure a victim. And all this girl has done is she's gone to buy her boyfriend a birthday present. She's last seen walking out of a jewelry shop. So he abducts her, he takes her back to his workshop. He then sexually assaults her whilst strangling her to death. So we're now being met by a complete escalation. He's not strangled her before killing her. He's not hung her whilst he's away from the room. No, now he's strangling her whilst having sex with her, whilst assaulting her. So now we are gravitating towards serial killing territory where they're enjoying the actual murder. And interestingly, he doesn't mutilate her corpse. And the reason that he doesn't do this is he decides her breasts were too pink. I don't know whether that's to do with him having an association with her being too youthful. Maybe the mutilation of a body that he felt wasn't necessarily as formed as the other women could have been a reasoning behind that. But there is something about her breasts that make him want to keep them intact. Instead, what he actually does is he tries to galvanize her body and he passes an electric current through it. And obviously it doesn't work. Has he been reading something like Frankenstein? I mean, what on earth he was imagining would occur, but he obviously wants to put voltage through it so that it essentially brings it some movement. So instead, in spite of the fact that he can't do that, and I imagine that would have been absolutely for sexual gratification to make the muscles contort, instead he just resorts to his trademark necrophilia. Later, he actually attaches her corpse to a car transmission with copper wire and nylon cord and again sinks it to the Willamette River because this is what's worked for him so far. He hasn't had a problem, has he? He's not been brought to justice. As far as he's concerned, he's got the perfect MO and he's carrying it through efficiently and is effectively disposing of the bodies. It is working for him. What we will know is in spite of the fact that he's growing in his arrogance and superiority and escalating in his crimes, law enforcement have four girls that are missing and the FBI are looking for them. And they've been looking for them for weeks and weeks and weeks. And whilst we know that Brudos believes that he's ensured the bodies won't be discovered, he's wrong because fishermen actually find Linda Sally's body on the 10th of May, 1969. It's floating in the Long Tom River. That's a tributary of the Willamette River in which Brudos, we know, had dumped her body. Karen's body then is found pretty much in the same place by police divers two days later. It's literally 50 feet from Linda's body. So this is now a murder investigation and that murder investigation is launched. Karen had actually been at university. So they start questioning people at the university campus and several students actually are able to describe a man 
who looked like he'd been acting suspiciously. And the way that they described him was that he looked like he was dressed like a Vietnam veteran. He was roaming around the grounds of Sackett Hall, that's the girls' dormitory at Oregon State University campus. And he'd been basically approaching girls and asking them for dates. He'd been phoning them, so we've seen that stalking behavior that we talked about earlier on. And his cover story was that he was a lonely Vietnam vet. So he wants them to feel sorry for him. He wants them to imagine that he's somebody who's fought for his country and now he's struggling. And it worked because some of the girls actually went on dates with him. So the police are obviously thinking, okay, this sounds like a profile of a man that we may want to investigate a little bit further. And they managed to find a woman who had agreed to go on a date with him. Again, he was claiming to be this Vietnam veteran. And he'd actually told her that he had discovered a new method of study when he was a patient in hospital and asked if she'd like to meet and discuss it. So basically that he's got this information that she might like to know about as a student. So she's like, okay, I'll hear you. I'm feeling sorry for you. You seem like a reasonable, soft-spoken guy. So she initially agrees. Now, she does actually change her mind because she becomes pretty suspicious and she speaks to the police about these suspicions that she has about him. And this collides with the investigation. And so the investigators are like, right, arrange a date with him. We want to set a honey trap up because then the police can be waiting and he will not expect this to be playing out. So she agrees. So the police set up this honey trap, she goes, and of course what happens is the moment that he arrives, the police arrest him. And it turns out that that was, I'm sure you were all aware, Brudos, who was the person who turned up and was pretending to be this Vietnam vet. He actually later admitted that he'd been wearing women's underwear and pedal pushers whilst roaming the university grounds. So again, very sexually charged. Now, initially, obviously, they don't have evidence that he's the murderer, but they do find it possible to charge him with the armed assault of the schoolgirl, Gloria Smith, who I talked about before. She was able to identify him from a police lineup. But just five days later, on the 30th of May, 1969, he's back in police custody. And I'll tell you why. Because he gave the police a false address. Not the best thing to do, Brudos. If you don't want to provoke suspicion, particularly when you are under suspicion of having potentially tried to abduct a young girl, it's not going to look good when you give them a fake address. Bit of advice out there for would-be criminals. Always good when the fair cups up that you just accept your bank to rights and hand over the correct information. Otherwise, it won't look good for you. So this raises suspicions further. They get a search warrant, of course they do. What is this guy trying to hide that he gave us a fake address? They search the property and what happens is they conclusively prove that they have their man. Why? Well, it turns out Brudos organized in his crimes, he may have been, but not organized in making sure that the police couldn't find all the information linking him to the crimes I've covered. So first of all, they discover the copper wiring. That's the same wiring that had been used to tie Linda Sally to the car transmission. That was before he dumped her in the body in the river. They find a nylon rope, well that was used to strangle some of his victims. Also, he's got a list of women's names, addresses and phone numbers. So that's leading them to this information. And then if that isn't enough, well, the piece de resistance is, photographic evidence of his crimes. He's got images of his victims before death and after death. They're all dressed in items from his personal collection of women's clothing and underwear and shoes. So again, that connects him with the victims. And some of those photographs are grotesque. You know, they show his victims hanging from the pulley. They find the breast paperweights and he is banged to rights. He can't get away with that, can he? So during the investigation and then the subsequent interrogation, he confesses to four murders. You won't be surprised to know that he got a nickname because of his paraphilia. So Brudos was nicknamed the shoe fetish slayer by the medium. He was also given the pseudonym, the lust killer. So 
the press always like to go to town on those and that's what they named him. So whilst Brudos in his interrogations does admit that he was responsible for killing the girls, or four of them, he originally pleaded not guilty by reasons of insanity to the first degree murders of Jan, Whitney, Karen, Sprinker and Linda Sally. However, of course, they're not just going to accept that, are they? They're going to do an evaluation. So they get the court-appointed psychiatrist and they do do thorough investigations and analysis of him. And it turns out he has no mental illnesses. Okay, he was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, but we would expect that from a sociopathic psychopath. You expect them to be pretty antisocial pretty antisocial murdering people. I think we can safely say that we'll give him that classification, but demonstrates that he was manipulative enough to try to get away with these murders, to try to get away with this insanity declaration, so to speak. Jan's body didn't even get found until a month after his conviction, but they felt that they had enough to go on. Firstly, he'd admitted to the killings, and also they felt because of the photographic evidence and all the information that they'd turned up from the search of his home, he still got charged with her murder. And like I said, he got pictures of her body per se, so it was obvious. On the 28th of June, 1969, that's three days before the trial, Brudos changed his plea to guilty. Now, Despite the fact that during his interrogation, he fully admitted that he'd murdered Linda Slauson, his first victim that was, he didn't actually get tried for it. Because the investigators just couldn't locate her body, and because, unlike all the other three victims, Brutus actually hadn't kept any photos of her body, it meant that investigators just didn't have sufficient evidence to secure a conviction. Ironic, I would have thought the murderer saying, I murdered her would have been enough. Like, you can't get it more confirmed from the person who actually went ahead and did it. And surely all of the other factors aggravating in this case would have demonstrated that it was very likely he did it, but whatever. They obviously didn't feel that he was ever going to walk the streets potentially again, so maybe they just let it slide for that. So Brudos got sentenced to three consecutive life sentences, all without the possibility of parole. Amen to that. No one should walk the streets when they're capable of such heinous crimes and such consistent criminality for such a long period of time. He didn't get sentenced to death because Oregon didn't actually have the death penalty at the time. He was incarcerated at the Oregon State Penitentiary. That was an all-male maximum security prison in Salem. Brudus' wife, Darcy, was also charged with aiding and abetting his crimes. Now, she pled not guilty, and she was ultimately acquitted with respect, but they felt that she had something to do with it. You won't be surprised to know she was like, I am going to support my loving husband for the rest of our lives. Till death do us part, I will visit you every week and I will bring up our children knowing that you are a good man in spite of these crap. That didn't happen. She was like, divorce, straight away. You freak me out when you have me doing the ironing in my buff, wearing heels, but this is my perfect reason to get away with it. So she divorces him, changes the name, takes the kids, moves to another city. Sensible lady, sensible lady. Now, even in prison, Brudos's what fetish does not ebb, shall we say. Now, he doesn't have any access to pornography. He doesn't have access to victims. So instead, he's like, mm, how do I get my foot fetish satiated? I know, I'll just get some catalogues from women's shoes come to an end. That's what I'll do. I'll just ask for the old Clark's magazine full of shoes, the old Grattan catalogue, Littlewoods maybe, just get the shoe section and spend time looking at those. And I guess that's really difficult because in prison, I guess you're allowed certain things and shoes aren't considered, shall we say, salacious. So I would arguably imagine that he did get access to those kind of things. But it's worrying because that means he's not actually dealing with that thing that had got him into so much trouble and caused the innocent lives of four women to just be murdered. It's just horrific to imagine this guy got to carry on fixating on this particular sexual paraphilia that was so distressing and disgusting for those people who've been affected by it. He then tries to appeal the conviction as they always do. And um, there is one really bizarre argument in that appeal, which is that a photo used at his original murder trial 
was of a different dead woman to the one that he was accused of murdering. So what's that? Yeah, I don't think that I should be in prison. Why? Well, I mean, you know, the picture of the dead woman there that's been murdered isn't the picture of the dead woman that you're saying I murdered. So there's an extra woman that you murdered. I mean, arguably you could look at it that way or you could look at it like, you know, you're taking the wrong woman and saying that I murdered her and I didn't because this is a different woman, which means that you murdered somebody else. We, I, I need to go away and rethink this argument. So it didn't work, but arguably does that mean he killed more people? I don't know. Maybe it was the picture of the person who was being accused of murdering, but maybe it wasn't. And you know, we all know that at that point in time, we're talking about the 60s, this is not a period where they have the technology to track women who just turned up dead in the way that they do in this modern day. And many people will have got away with killing multiple people without ever being brought to justice for it. Now, during his incarceration, he actually managed to complete degrees in general sciences. He did counseling as well. He also undertook a master's in counseling, which kind of disturbs me a little bit. I often think that when you have people like this, the last thing that you want to do is reinforce them with new skills. So it's like, hey, let's just make this mass manipulator a therapist or a psychologist as well so they can really hone their skills, right? But nonetheless, he gets away with doing that. I imagine it's important to keep people active and I suppose arguably there are probably positions in prison for mentors who can work with other prisoners but it always finds in my opinion a bit of disconcertion when I actually explore the fact that they equip them with psychological methods. He actually had 17 years of psychological treatment in prison and he stated I'm more stable now than I ever was out on the streets. And he has tried multiple times to secure parole. On one occasion, he actually was asked by the parole board why he'd committed the torture murders, and he refused to answer. He actually claimed the public session wasn't the forum to discuss the issue. He said, this is information I wanted to give to the board without it becoming a public record or reading it in the newspaper. I have no intention of burying my soul. Now on one level we can say, well maybe that's because it was incredibly painful and he didn't want to explore what had actually occurred for him in early childhood with the parole board in the public domain. Or it could be that he's decided through all his counselling work that really he doesn't want to equip people out there with reasons that they could use as excuses for reprehensible behaviour. But for me, it probably just is about him being arrogant and superior. He probably doesn't even have a reason that would ever mitigate the actions in any way, shape or form or come close to. And the problem with the parole board is if you're going to give a reason why you've acted in a certain way, you better be damn sure it makes sense because they are going to come down on you hard if it looks like you're minimising your crime. So I think it was more about protecting himself from that because he knew that he would just come across as a minimizer but also that keeping the power, being superior and arrogant. I know why I did this, but I'm not going to share that with you. Trying to control and manipulate the circumstances that could also play into this. And certainly he does sound like somebody who's highly manipulative. Just think about the behavior around his wife and not letting her come into the garage and so on and so forth and controlling her in the household when she cleaned. This is not a man who struggles to manipulate. In 1995, Ultimately, the parole board advised that he would never be released. And the main part of this was because he refused to discuss his crimes. He would still be allowed to appeal every two years, but it would not be a parole hearing. It was instead described as a formal interview. In 2005, Brudos claimed that the parole's board to permanently deny him parole was actually an act of vengeance. He stated, this is not over. They cannot remove my legal rights. Brudos, you think the group of people on the parole board who realised that you murdered four innocent women and tried to abduct more and did horrible crimes against other women per se throughout your life, you think that they might be a bit vengeful towards you when you don't take responsibility for it? minimize your crimes and refuse to acknowledge what you did in a public debate so that they can understand whether you are still a threat and you think that they're being nasty to you? 
well, maybe it is a bit of an act of vengeance because revenge might be something that we shy away from in our society. None of us want to be vengeful in a way that can cause us catastrophes in our personal life. We don't want to do things that are so horrible to other people that even though we might feel good in the moment, in the long term, it damages us. But can we look at justful vengeance? It is possible to have justful vengeance. And for this man who murdered four innocent women to be told, you're never getting out, deal with it. Well, that would seem like logical vengeance as well, wouldn't it? And again, what's he demonstrating? This superiority, this arrogance, this belief that he deserves better than he dealt his victims, simple as. And it's quite ironic, because whilst he's saying this isn't over, they cannot remove my legal rights. Well, you know who's gonna remove those rights? God, because it was pretty much over. Following year, 28th of March, 2006, Brudos died in prison of liver cancer. At the time of his death, he was the longest incarcerated inmate in Oregon Department of Corrections. He'd served 37 years. Looking back over the years, there have been lots of people who suggested that his wife Darcy had been complicit in his crimes. It does on one level, with respect, when I've looked back at this information, it seems pretty inconceivable that she was completely unaware of what was going on in his garage workshop. I mean, he kept the bodies of his victims at the house for days. I mean, he even killed some of his victims while she and the kids were present in the house. Now, she wasn't allowed into the garage. I appreciate that. She wasn't allowed into the workshop without getting his prior permission. So this should at least lend itself to her understanding that he must have been hiding something. And I guess we have to pose the question, could it be that she didn't know? Or... Could it be that she didn't care? Could it be that she was just getting on with her life and trying to ignore what was going on because she knew that he was a monster, but she just wanted to pretend that it wasn't happening? But I don't know. Only she knows. I mean, we can only be grateful that Brudos was apprehended as quickly as he was realistically, because when his crimes actually came out and when they escalated to murder, well, his kill count was rapidly growing. It was within 15 months he killed four people and he attempted to abduct at least another two others. And this was a guy who was a perverted sexual predator. He was a lust killer, he was a necrophiliac. And without a doubt, he carried out those torture murders to purely satisfy his sexual desires. He had this insatiable paraphilia that dominated his life. Like I said right at the beginning, whether we're dealing with somebody who was born a psychopath, born a monster, so to speak, a human predator, or whether he was molded into one during his really abusive childhood, his neglectful parenting, his sense of alienation and isolation by his family, whether that was a kink that could have grown into something so much more sinister because of those experiences growing up, because of the way that he dealt with shame, the way that he felt that sex was sordid, the way he wanted his mother's love but wasn't given it and was confused and constantly made to feel that he wasn't enough as a boy and it would have been better if he'd been a girl and the abandonment and rejection, the neglect, the abuse, these are all very, very toxic experiences that took that little kink into something far more dangerous. You know, the psychiatric valuations he had did indicate that he had this hatred of women and it seemed to have been developed from this seething resentment of this overbearing, unloving mother that I described earlier on. So essentially, was he broken by her or was he born broken? You know, what's clear when we look at him as an adult is we have a ruthless, sadistic serial killer. And he would, wow, he would have continued to kill and kill and kill if he hadn't been stopped. One of the detectives who apprehended him, in my opinion, summed him up best. So I'm going to say what he said. He said, he was one of the true monsters of the United States. Perhaps the world. I think that that is a very good summing up of this man. Absolutely one of the few monsters in this world. Brudos 
without a doubt was a damaged child. We always have to explore those contributory factors. Could things have been different for him? Likely, yes. Would he always have had some form of predilection? Potentially. Would it have eventuated in him murdering these innocent women? Possibly not. And they're the questions that we always have to ask ourselves as a society because it is possible that if parenting is good, if children are met with nurture and the foundations that they deserve, then these kind of events can be prevented from playing out. I'm not saying in this case it would have, but certainly when we look at his childhood, we can all see the indicators that absolutely contributed towards his growing resentment and rage, and ultimately potentially to his fixation with the passivity of a woman i.e. not wanting a relationship with the woman, but just wanting to use the body of a woman. And like I said earlier on, is that female form the reflection of the self that he felt abandoned by, by his mother? The fact that he could never achieve and attain the very thing that his mother had wanted, that little girl that he could never have been. Isn't it interesting to look at how these kind of intricacies, these ingredients of possibility can toxify and become so dangerous? I hope you found this case interesting, intriguing. I hope it's not one that you know very well. As ever, our thoughts go to the victim's families. It's heinous what happened to them. And I'm so glad that he was brought to justice before he got to kill any more, which he undoubtedly would have. Join me again for another True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Merch is out. There's a link below. Thanks for all your support. If you've watched this and you like what you saw, get yourself subscribed. Twice a week, Wednesdays and Sundays. What's not to love? See you again next time, guys. Bye.